So um, the title of the book is State and Family in China Filial Piety and its Modern Reform. So of course, just as the title indicates, is the empirical topic is intergenerational relations in imperial China and its modern reform, of course. But the purpose is not just to look at filial piety or intergenerational relations, but to look at state and family relationship in China's empire to nation transformation. And I hope this, um, the, uh, the book uh, cover, as Dan showed you, like it has the character on the cover. And one of the reasons why I didn't have the have an image, I think the most important reason is actually this character really tells a story, probably as much as the book itself. Because if we, if we read this character, this part means child, right? Child doesn't just mean a child as a, a manner, but also child in the parent-child relationship as an offspring. But this part, the upper part means elder. So basically, filial piety, when we talk about it, it means the elders, the seniors over the child, right? And it's a hierarchy. And why it is so important, you know, for, uh, for China's empire to nation transformation, um, we need to start from the very word that means the state or the nation in modern China and in late imperial China. It's called guojia, right? It's a compound. And that combines the guo means, that's the topic of my second book. It means simultaneously nation state, country, empire, polity, dynasty regime, right? It meant dynastic state until uh, the word was used to translate the nation in terms of international law, the nation international law in the 19th century. And then the meaning of the dynastic state or regime stick with the nation state all the way until today, right? That's the topic of my second book, but that's the, you know, when it's used alone, the guo means the state or nation, whatever. We, we use the state probably because, you know, I cannot, you know, every time I cannot use this series of meaning. But usually in conversation, it's also called guo jia, it's an extended version, right? It means the same thing as guo as if it's used alone. And guo jia, right, basically means state. Family. So this is the word for family. You can see how important, how central family is to the state, as reflected by the very word of the state is called state family. And the family also, originally, the word family means hereditary noble family. Not everyone's family is a family, basically. But then it again, the meaning of the average family, uh, well before the uh, the 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 and the meaning of the nation, right? It was already there pretty much during Confucius' time. But then the state family relationship was always very central to basically study of China, imperial China or modern China. And I will show you, you know, just some of the selected books that I really love uh, on the topic of state family relations produced in the last few decades, etc. It's from chastity, concubinage, domestic servitude, polyandry, illicit sex, sex sexuality, that's for the impure China, right? And for modern China, right, the, the notion discourse on Chinese vision of family and state, mostly new marriage and small nuclear family, reform of concubinage, reform of divorce, and a reform of human trafficking, especially selling of women. And then the last one ends with the communist family reform in the so-called border regions that were controlled by the Chinese Communist Party in the um, 1940s and 1930s and 40s until when the CCP or Chinese Communist Party took over the whole country, the institutions were uh, spread to the whole nation, right? But if we look at the topic, yes, those were the, uh, the, the works the representative works that uh, studied state family relations in the late imperial, uh, late imperial period and in, uh, uh, for the 20th century. But almost all discussion of state family relations in late imperial China and the state initiated family reform in modern China focused on conjungal or sexual relations. Um, 
Um, does it mean that just because, oh, you know, the, the, the scholarship uh, reflects the reality that, you know, conjugal sexual relations really occupy the centrality in politics and society in late imperial China or modern China, or it reflects our own bias, you know, of as modern people in China or in the West that we are predisposed to focus more on conjugal sexual relations. Um, that's the question. I really want to ask uh, why I ask this question. Partly because when I grew up in China, there's something that's, you know, basically I heard and I observed in society that filial piety or intergenerational hierarchy was and is probably even now more important uh, in, its, uh, in its influence on politics and social hierarchy than gender relations. It doesn't mean I don't appreciate the important, importance of a gender hierarchy. I think my, I regard myself as a gender historian. Most of my publications are actually on gender history. But the thing is, I need to say what I see, especially in pure politics. There was an old saying that was widely accepted in late imperial China and was raised by emperors and, uh, and intellectuals all the time. It's called ruling all under heaven through filial piety. It was not ruling or under heaven through chastity or something like that, right? So, you know, yes, and then we look at how filial piety was discussed in scholarship, and there are several books I uh, listed here. Uh, the most important ones were um, Angela Zito's Of Body and Brush that look at the grand sacrifices uh, as performed by the emperors toward heaven and toward their ancestors and that and the uh, political implication of that and also uh, Norman Kutcher's uh, morning in late imperial China is on the morning filial morning and how the state regulated that um, during the Qing dynasty etc but before 19, 2019 that's where uh, orthodox passions was published you know, the, the, the focus of those discussion of intergenerational relations was on ritual practice, right? And there were also a lot of debates in journals, philosophy, et cetera. They would talk about, oh, the relevance of filial piety to the contemporary world, either for China or for the world. But they focus on the ritual prescriptions in Confucian texts. They were not looking at how family order was enforced on the ground as those good works on gender did, right? And the filial um, uh, orthodox passion was uh, groundbreaking in the sense that it really tried to focus on uh, focus the China field to filial piety, but it was on the filial emotions, basically love, filial love, right? It was important. And, and then in, in terms of Chinese language scholarship, that's a little bit more. For example, Xiao Zhi Tianxia, ruling all under heaven through filial piety, discussed the, there was a classic it's called Classics of Filial Piety, still the classics, etc. And on 20th century, right, and there were books that touch upon uh, those issues of the reform, but mostly discussed the intergenerational relations in the bigger uh, family reform, right? It's part of the civil code or uh, a family revolution, et cetera, it's the only small part. So what my book tries to achieve, uh, it was quite ambitious. I had to admit, I was a little bit hesitated when I started writing this book. And the first it started from my dissertation, right? But then I thought, you know, it, the, the, the project demanded me to be that ambitious. And I had to do it because I also was so, right? So if the project demanded me to be so ambitious, to address so many different things, and then I had to. So what I wanted to achieve was I want this book to uh, lay at the intersection of legal history and the political cultural history. I want to look at the, the discourse, but more importantly, I wanted to look at how these intergenerational hierarchies was enforced by the state through the law on the ground, down to the county level, down to the villages, and connect that to the purpose of the state side for the whole legal regime, right? So it's not just about discourse or uh, analyzing Confucian tax on 
filial piety, but also what was really going on on the ground, how that influenced the way people behaved, the way people thought. Second, I want to look at the intersection of gender and the generational relations. I treated the hierarchical networks of late imperial China, I call it uh, generational. So it wasn't a gender, it wasn't just intergenerational, it was gender regional relationship that not that didn't always prioritize all men over all women all the time. Rather, it was very complicated. And both gender hierarchy and generational hierarchy were exploited by the state for its own legitimation. And the third, I want to I want this project to be a long durable project. I look at you know what was happening across centuries. And we could have the imperial part and say, oh, the, 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 everything, the logic was perfect, everything added up. And we could have a reform in the 20th century, but if we put two together, it told a different story. And to be honest, I was trained as a Qing legal historian. It was a little bit too ambitious, but I hope it achieved what it you know, aimed to achieve. And there are many, the, the two reviewers were so kind, they gave me like, each of them more than 10 pages of suggestions while they were very supportive of the, of the project. But one of them, I think one thing that still stays with me after revision was one of them <laughs> said in the review report at the press, it, uh, he or she said, the book doesn't read like the first book. It's um, it, the, the scale and what, the, the way uh, it reads is like, a, it, it's as if it's a book by a mature scholar with this, uh, uh, ability to handle sources, but also the, the, the confidence to propose big arguments. So this, uh, is the, um, this is the tip of contents, and I want to show you this to, to, to discuss a little bit how I approach uh, this book, the bigger picture, and then I will delve into several chapters to look at what's going on here. So if you look at this, it really started from the ancient time, failure parity beyond Confucianism and the introduction, which I want to, I propose here that yes, we treat failure parity as something about Confucianism, but it was pre-Confucian. It was a pre-Confucian notion, ideology, that was recognized by Confucianism. A, its root was even deeper than Confucianism. Uh, and then it went you know, through the part one ruling the empire through the principle of filial parity. I used the last dynasty of China from the 17th century to 1911 as almost like uh, as a representative of late imperial China, the, the last two, at least the last two dynasties. And to see how the principle of ruling the empire through filial piety wasn't just like discourse indoctrination, but it materialized in the day-to-day -day legal practice that people, yes, if they wanted to be filial, it was great. If they didn't want to be filial, they still had to be filial because if they didn't, there were all sorts of legal mechanism that would force them to. And it was related to political discourse, et cetera, everything, right? And then the part two, was on the Republican reform, mostly on the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and the legal reform, et cetera. And, and then these two parts, they mirror each other. Of course, in terms of content, basically the second part, the Republican period wanted to overthrow, right, the generational hierarchy, right? But then the structure, the both parts mirror each other because the first two chapters of each part really um, our legal history, look at the through legal sources, look at you know, uh, how, how those norm, either the old norm of generational hierarchy or the new norm of intergenerational equality was reinforced by the state through the, the courts and pleas, etc. But the third one was not legal history. The chapter three and chapter six, they were talking about the political motivations of each legal regime, why it was the case it was. Of course, there were a lot of, you know, you know the, 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 the social custom was like that, et cetera, but why the state had any motivation to devote resources to enforce the old or new order. I want to look at you know, how the political um, regime and political logic paralleled with the legal logic 
in terms of intergenerational relations. And then I tell the whole story of China's empire to nation transformation. It, the, even the transformation the, of the parent-child relationship was part of a constitutional structure. And I'm not, I'm, when I talk about the empire to nation transformation, it wasn't just, oh, there was an emperor, so it was an empire. And then there was a president, so it was a nation. Rather, the ruling dynamic was changed from indirect rule, ruling through family, to direct rule, that everyone was atomized and connected directly to the state. And that was the driving force of those overhauling of the whole family order, intergenerational relations included. And then the conclusion was about what's going on now. Post-1949 and the Maoist period, when really this dream within 50 years, right, from this upholding of absolute hierarchy be between parents and children to the Mao, like calling children to accuse their parents, disown their parents, etc. And then, because it went so extreme, there was a reversal in the 1980s. Uh, the revival of family values, revival of filial parity, and now, until now, that there's a state-sponsored program to promote not just filial parity, but in Xi Jinping's own words, it's a filial parity, filial obedience toward the state. We can see some sort of combination of the old failure party to statism of the 20th century. So what uh, this, oops, this is the Chinese version of the table of contents. But then what I'm going to do is to um, go through some of the chapters. I select four chapters. And then I also, you know, in each chapter I will use one case. I usually, it's very much like how I write a book. I usually start the empirical legal history chapters with one case. And why I said this case, there are so many different cases. Usually this case can demonstrate the points for all of each of the sections. I discuss different uh, legal um, institutions to uphold a specific Point. That is, for example, chapter one is the parental notion of parental infallibility. Basically, basically, it means there are no occasions on which parents can ever be wrong. It's an old Chinese saying. It's called 天下无不是的父母. And then there are different uh, legal institutions, right? And then within each section, I have more cases, a lot of cases, demonstrate how it functions, etc. But I also want, you know. I understand that arguments usually don't stick with people, and it are, <laughs> I hope the cases do. So I always get one case that, that is used at the very beginning of each chapter, starting from the story. And then the story kind of demonstrates each fact of the sections, and then I dive into sections. So the, in the presentation, of course, I will just go through the case, because I cannot cover like 50 cases in one chapter. But the structure is very similar for uh, the, the, the four empirical chapters on uh, the, the legal institutions. I'll start from chapter one, the whole notion of parental infallibility, and just use one case that is it's called Jiang Qi Shun case. Uh, it happened in 1821. So what was going on here? So there was a father-in-law that tried to, how to say that, induce his daughter-in-law to have sex with him. And According to the testimonies that was gathered, it seems that the father-in-law raped the daughter-in-law, but it didn't count as a rape, because to count this case as a rape, the daughter-in-law needed to report immediately after she was raped. And also she needed to demonstrate that, oh, I resisted, so it, you know, she either died or showed this like, torn clothes, etc. So it was very difficult for daughter-in-law to even demonstrate she was raped. So what the daughter-in-law did was like, yeah, she just tolerated it, and then the father-in-law um, so-called resumed the illicit sex twice after that. And then the, the, the Jiang Jishun's son found out what was going on, and he couldn't report it to the authorities, right? Because there was a, a, the, the legal institution is called mutual, uh, uh, no, mandatory consumment of parents' crimes. It originated in Confucian notion that parents should, um, uh, should hide the crimes committed by their children, children should hide the crimes committed by parents. However, in late impure legal practice, it was very unilaterally. So basically means the children were obliged to hide the crimes committed by parents, but parents were not obliged to hide the crimes committed by children. Not just that, parents would not be punished 
if they falsely accuse their offspring, right? So it was very, it, it was justified by Confucianism, but the spirit was not Confucian spirit, right? You can see how the empire really used Confucianism. And then the son couldn't, because even if it proved to be true, his accu um, accusation proved to be true, he would be, uh, he would suffer three years of penal servitude. Uh, and he would be beaten 100, by 100 strikes of bamboo stick. So of course, nobody would, like, in this scenario, you can imagine, he would not. So what he tried to do was he wanted to move with his wife to a separate residence. So basically avoid this physical contact between the father-in-law and daughter-in-law. But that means he committed lack of filial piety because sons were obliged to live with their parents. There was another, that's a section one, right? Uh, many, many more cases on this. And then the second one, um, the, then he suffered a second like, institution. It was the, the county magistrate. There was, it's called Kong Shou Wu Yi, disciplining unfilial sons by the county court. So the county court basically offers some service to parents that if the parents, either father or mother, et cetera, they felt like their sons were unfilial, they could report it to the county side, and the county magistrate would arrest that person to beat, right? Beat the unfilial son publicly, or can you the son right here, um, or got the son exiled and paid by the government, right? And in terms of can you, the parent could determine how long the son was can you. And then the father, of course, and there were two ways. Either the father could go to the court to say, like, oh, yes, you arrest the son. Or he could gather a bunch of guys to arrest the son and send to the court. So he got a bunch of guys to, uh, to, to get the son, to send the son to the court, to accuse the son of lack of filial piety. So he could be exiled or beaten, whatever. Then the son resisted, and he died. He died in resistance, and because... You know, it was assumed that parents always love children. So it was assumed that, you know, in this sort of accidental death, it was a parent that had a final say in the disposition of the case. So the father said, yeah, my son died in the affray. I have no idea where these people came from. So the kid got, got disposed, right? It was just an accident. But why it ended up in this, like, central level archives? Because... He, he, of course, that the son died. Now he wanted to resume the illicit sex with the daughter-in-law. And he had some wine. He said, yes, actually, I arranged the death of your husband. The daughter-in-law was like, no. And she killed him. And that's how this case became a serious case. Because killing a son was nothing, basically. It led to very light punishment. We would not have this case in the central level archives at all, even if it was figured out. But killing one's father-in-law was like killing one's own father, right? That was a big thing. So that, that's how the case ended up in the central archives. And that led to the third thing, that parricide led to slicing to death. So it was like, there, were, there are many, if you just search online, like slicing to death, there are a lot of draconian pages I don't want to show you. It could be like, basically, death by a thousand cut, not just applicable to men, but also to women. Right? Women, if they committed parasite to, uh, against their own parents or parents-in-law, etc. And not just that, in the Qin Dynasty, all the other penal, uh, uh, not penal, uh, the, uh, the, the, the death penalty needed to be endorsed by the emperor before it could be carried out, except in two scenarios. The first was re rebellion, right? the other was parasite. And it was reformed during the middle of the Qin, in the, uh, under the Tianlong Emperor in the 18th century because they thought they really, really want this person to be executed to stage the show. And if they waited too long, the person could die or they could commit suicide. So it's different. The parasite cases were just very different. They just really wanted the show. So the legal procedure was reformed to allow those parasites to be executed, right? And even before the reveal. And the, not just that, the state paid the money to send the parasite back into where he committed the crime. And the, the, the uh, provincial governors actually didn't want to pay, so they wrote to the emperor and said, you know, it's like very costly, etc. But the emperor really insisted on that. And then, you know, obviously, it was the father-in-law who committed the crime first, 
But of course, section four, uh, parents can never be wrong. Being obedient was being righteous. And there were many other cases. But in this case, or in many other cases, the message was very clear that there are no occasions parents can never be wrong. Even if, if they're doing something wrong, they are still correct for their children, not for everybody else. Right, and then you can see like how it's, it's almost like I, wish, uh, I have this similar structure for uh, the chapters one, two, uh, four, five. Like it starts from from one case that is usually quite dramatic, and it's and it leads to um, the four sections or three sections that um, target you know or, or point to a one point, and the the point for chapter one is parents can never be wrong. Right, and then I have uh, the second uh, second chapter on how people negotiated it by abuse the system by, for example, killing their own kids to falsely accuse their neighbors because killing one's own kids led to very light punishment. So people were aware of that, and the central government was aware of like people were doing that, but they just couldn't like deal with that. Right, why there was a case, etc. So it was on. Um, the negotiation, but eventually why the state was willing to tolerate that or connive at it, because eventually it upheld the logic that the parents were over children, right? And, and the, 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 the killing children was insignificant as compared to killing parents, etc. That was chapter two. And chapter three, and I discussed why, right? Why the state wanted to uphold this logic, because this logic the parental infallibility, for example, was applicable not just to family members, but also to the state. The magistrate referred to himself as father-mother official, and emperor referred to himself as a father-mother to the people. So, of course, they wanted this logic because it made ruling the subject so much easier for them. Right, and so here is... Um, what I said, I, 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 I will basically tra translate for you. It's called the Qianlong Emperor in 1736. He said, you know, I rule all under heaven with absolute justice, right? And I honor the heaven and I rule the people with, uh, you know, diligence, etc." And he said, I, as a son of heaven, I parent all under heaven on behalf of heaven. And... Uh, you know, the, the people who resisted my rule, and I, because they don't understand me, and as a parent, I know they are stupid kids, they don't understand, they are in water and in fire, so that's why they resist. But as a parent, I have the obligation to protect them, even if they don't understand. Right, and what he tries to do is to persuade the governor, because the governor, there was something called Gai Tu Gui Liu, transforming the um, transforming the hereditary chieftains into a direct administration. And a lot of local, usually non-Han people, they resisted to say, oh, it, it was very costly. So the, a lot of governors didn't want to continue with that project at all. So what he tried to do was to persuade governors to say, yes, you are also the parents. You are parents to people under your jurisdiction on my behalf. You can see this logic of empire. Right? It wasn't like, oh, the emperor was directly connected to the subjects. Rather, it was like he was parenting people on behalf of heaven. The provincial governors were parenting people on behalf of the emperor. Etc. It was a layered governance. That was an empire. And then the logic of parental infallibility, for example, was applicable not only to the parents in the families, but also to the parent emperor, parent magistrate, Etc. And there was a legal mechanism. It was called United Under One Supreme Authority that made sure that no independent kingdoms would be formed. Because when we discuss, oh, you know, the Roman law also had a pita familia, etc. But when we look at the Roman Empire, when the empire extended or intervened into the daily life of everybody, actually the parental power got weakened, right? The, the power of the pita familia got weakened precisely because the state got stronger, got more authoritarian, if that makes sense. But in, in pure China, it was exactly the opposite, right? When the Ming and the Qing state be, became more assertive, assertive in everyday life, the parental power got more strict, more hierarchical, right? Why it was the case? 
because the Chinese law had this dynamics called united under one authority that would allow, would not allow, would prevent the formation of independent kingdoms in the family and in the provinces. So how that worked? It means, yes, the son needed to submit himself to the parents, but the parents needed to submit themselves into grand and the grandparents. So there were layers, and the lower level, the people at the lower level, was not encouraged to appeal to the higher level authority. But the higher level authority could step in any time to override the lower level authority. It was very coherent in politics, but also in the law. For example, if the parents were scolding the kid, Right, but then the grandparents disagree with the method, and there was a case, uh, there was a case that the 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 the, the uh, judicial officials they were discussing the case was basically an old lady committed suicide because his son and daughter-in-law was scolding the grandson, and she felt like she fell for the grandson, so she killed herself, even though the judicial officials admitted that it was the parents. Uh, responsibility to discipline the kid because the kid was doing wrong things. However, the grandmother's authority still over, uh, overrode the parental authority. So the, the son and the daughter-in-law still basically were, were punished because there was this hierarchy. But also the grandsons were not encouraged, they were not basically allowed to appeal to grandparents. Right? The grandparents could intervene anytime. But the grandsons, if you appeal to grandparents to try to override the, uh, override the authority of your parents, that's wrong. Right? And even in these sort of like uh, appellate cases, there was one case that the Qianlong Emperor, right, there was a person who uh, like some made a memorial to say, like, yes, there was a disaster relief, and you issued this edicts, but the provincial officials, the local officials, they uh, embezzled money, and we didn't get anything. And the emperor forwarded this guy to be punished by the provincial governor. Why? He said, yes, of course, it was wrong for the provincial governors to do this. I will punish him. However, you subjects are like grandsons. Like the provincial, <laughs> the provincial, uh, the, 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 like the, um, the provincial officials were like father, even though grandparents love their grandchildren, but he would not allow grandchildren to use the grandparent to override <laughs> the authority of the parents. So you can see like it's that the whole logic wasn't just legal logic, it was ritual logic, political logic everywhere, that it really made the system that seems to be very coherent. And why there was a case, I think there will be a professor who come here next week to talk about the physical state. Why the Ming and the Qing Empire really had a great motivation to uphold parental authority because the Ming and the Qing state charge very low taxes. So they didn't have the capacity as medieval China to enforce the state, a lot of state rules. So they wanted to use this layer of family rule to keep people obedient so that they could rule at a very low cost, right? I'm not saying it's just the only reason, but there was a physical reason out there. And then, then move on to the modern period. Um, so the chapter four uh, discussed this reorientation of parent-child relations to look at how, how the Republican government started to look at children's rights, right? The parental abuse of children started to draw police attention that, you know, in the chapter two, we discussed a family side, the kidney children was nothing, right? And even if it was adult children, even if it was committed out of malice, so what? Punishment was very light. That's why people were so smart to use the system to accuse their neighbors. But the Republican law reforms gradually in the 1910s and 1920s and 30s started to say like, yes, parents and children, you know, the parents had the rights, but to, the right to raise the children. And if the parents abuse the children, the parents needed to be penalized, right? Put to prison, et cetera. And also a lot of police uh, um, records to say that, you know, the, 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 the best case I love is in the 1940s, there was a hyperinflation. So everyone's life was miserable, basically. And one of the uh, one small kid steal food from neighbors. So it seems that his mom beat him. And the neighbors got really um, disturbed because he was like, Screaming, right? They reported to the police to say, like, yeah, the, 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 the mom was abusing uh, the kids. 
And the priest got the mom and also the dad to the police station. The dad was a cook, so they summoned, like, got him out of the work. And after medical examination, they figured out only the son was beaten. The daughter was not even beaten. And the son was defending the parents. He like, I did something wrong. You shouldn't, like, blame my mom because I, I steal food from my neighbor. But then the police still basically... Um, reprimanded the parents and let the parents sign this thing that, oh, you know, basically I've done something wrong, I won't uh, abuse the kids anymore. And then the police told the parents that even beating your own children is wrong. <laughs> so they, because a lot of people still believe that, you know, it's my kid, why I cannot beat him, etc. So you can see this change of mindset, right? It doesn't mean the state could intervene in and every case, maybe in the big cities, etc., but not in every case, but you can see this reversal of the logic. And also adult children were allowed to submit legal cases against their parents. And that's basically one of the sections was look at how the adult children use the system to um, defend their own rights against um, parents. But what I'm trying to show here, uh, down into this was chapter five. It's called Reconceptualizing Parent-Child Relations from Lifelong Parental Privilege to Transitory Guardianship. Basically, I look at how the Republican government reconceptualized parent child relations as temporary, right? Just as we have now in China or in the United States, that it's not the, the lifelong relationship as in the imperial time, because in imperial time, it doesn't matter. The son was 50 years old, was a breadwinner, right? He still needs to obey his parents or even widow mother unconditionally. It was a lifelong privilege. But then in the 20th century, the state would say that, yes, of course, the parents raise their children until they reach 21, right? And then they were like ecosystems, et cetera, et cetera. And it had implications on so many things. The first was on marriage, right? And marriage was a very gendered institution that was not just about women's rights. Because in pre-modern China, marriage, it's not like men could choose their spouse. Only women's marriage was arranged. Everyone's marriage was arranged by parents because by definition, marriage was a contract signed by the parents of the groom and the parents of the bride. They didn't even need to meet. They were married legally, right? And the marriage reform in the 20th century was previously discussed as a gender revolution, which was true. But things, it was an intergenerational reform because it, the law deprived the parents' rights in arranging marriage at all. So one of the cases, I start with this chapter, with this Hai Gui case. So a mom went to the police station in 1946 saying, oh, my daughter was abducted by a married man, right? And now I'm the uh, legal head of household. I care about her, etc. So you need to intervene. And then the police basically got the, the daughter and the, the, the lover, right? And they, they ask the daughter, yes, you know, uh, uh, you are ab uh, abducted or induced by the man. Uh, you, you need to be aware that you know, he is married, etc. cetera. And the, the daughter said, I'm 26, right? And not just like, I understand he's married, but also his wife doesn't want to intervene. So what's your business, right? And then, that's, and then the police also tried to persuade the man to confess that, actually, I induced a woman. And the man said, my partner is 26. <laughs> So basically, they, because they understood this like legal majority, like she is in her legal majority, it's not your business, and it's not the police business, it's not the mom's business. And then it seems that the police tried to help, but then they had to issue this eventually, issue this document to the mom to tell her that you have no standing here. So you can see that, you know, it's a dramatic case, but we can see you know, this entirely reconceptualization of parenthood. Once the kid reached legal majority, the parent basically had very little to say anything in their life. And yes, there was a so-called jia, or there was an institution of the family, but the family had, had no control over adult members. The adult members, if they could support themselves, they could leave anytime to form their own jia or family, right? So, um, but then it seems to be all oh, just about freedom. It wasn't, because it resulted in the systematic uh, restructuring of society in the case that before this reform, many couples raised their daughters, right, to a certain age, and then they could sell their daughters and then got the bread price to support themselves. And now, 
they, they had no say in the marriage, and their daughter just ran away. And it meant other things. For example, in this Wang Mei Yu Shuang case in 1939, the mom went to police to say, you know, Mei Yu Shuang, her daughter was cohabiting with somebody, and she stopped bringing money. So I, you can feel that she really cared about the money her daughter brought in. And then she, she also wants to see that, yes, and that, that guy, I have no idea of where he's from. So it compromised the, the future of my daughter, et cetera. But it seems that the issue was, first, the mom couldn't sell the daughter in the marriage. So she couldn't recover any investment. Second, the daughter, once she formed her own marital family, stopped bringing money. So you can see this structural change that really influenced one thing, that was the, the, the elderly support. Because previously, in other sections, I discussed this arrangement of property that parents, uh, even widow mothers, had this lifelong custodial rights of property, not just of this landed property, but also of the basic of the labor of the younger generation. Right? And they could get support because, you know, if the, if the children refuse to support, they could just tell the magistrate to discipline them. So it wasn't an issue. But in the 20th century, it became an issue because now everyone had their own pro property, right? And then the, the parents of the daughters couldn't even sell their daughters into marriage. So what's going to happen to the elders? So there were like new legal arrangements that allow parents and other relatives, like parents-in-law brothers, to ask for support from other relatives. So you can see this like uh, different arrangement of property in the light of this um, remaking of generational relations. But why? Why the Republican government had the motivation? I'm not saying they didn't want to be progressive. They didn't want to learn from the West, etc. But then there was a logic that why they wanted to invest it in this, in lawmaking, uh, from the late, the late 1910s all the way until, of course, it went really extreme after 1949. So I will read, uh, translate this paragraph from 1910, but then the logic persisted all the way to the Maoist period about why the state wanted to change these intergenerational relations. Why, uh, yes, now he said in 1910, in defense of the new criminal code, that was uh, under deliberation in the National Assembly. He said, China is bad, or China has fallen, because there are so too many benevolent fathers, failed sons, good elder brothers, and submissive younger brothers, but too few loyal subjects or loyal citizens. And he said, from ancient time, it's always the ruler rules the uh, ministers, the ministers rules the heads of households, and heads of households would rule the family members. And that means like every family would be united, that means the society would be very stable without problem. However, now it's a new situation that the main enemy is not the people, the main enemy is foreign countries. We need everyone to be very productive, very creative, and we also need everyone to shoulder the responsibility of the state, right? So he said, so the ritual morality and law in all other countries, of course, he was an exaggeration, focused on the statism. Statism was the spirit, right? And stated the, the stated state must have every citizen connect directly to the state, not indirect to the state. So everyone's basic resources, the labor, would be extracted by the state for the sake of the state. So you can see, uh, and also in 1929, 1930, when they were making the new civil code that really changed, uh, changed the generational relations, right? And then Hu Hanmin and Fu Binchang, those lawmakers would say, yes, what we want is to separate individuals from families, not for the individual's sake, because that's bad. That's your American individualism. That doesn't serve us. But, but these itemized individuals would be able to serve society and state better. So that's the first step. First step is to separate people from their families. The second step was to connect them directly to the state and society so they can serve a larger course. That's why China is superior to Western way, right? That's what they try to show, like, you know, some injury or the three principles of the people, so I say, et cetera. But you can see the logic here. They even argue, like, say, yeah, marriage, the happiness of marriage has very little to do with the happiness of the family. They could even say that. But it has much to do with the strength of the state. 
because it produced and cultivated the next generation. So you can see the logic, right? And then it means this, the, that, that the, 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 the logic was to connect citizens directly to the state. And it was not for the sake of the individuals, rather it was to itemize individuals, right? And then that's why during the 1920s and 30s, people were talking about dismantling the family for the state. Wei Guo Po Jia. For the state, we for the state, we dismantle the family. Right? That's the logic. And then we sort of return to the whole issue of state and the family. State and family were connected in late imperial China, and they were connected in 20th century China, and they are still connected in contemporary China. But the logic changed dramatically in the China's empire to nation transformation. The nation, the, the empire was a family writ large because the family was employed by the imperial government to justify imperial rulership. It was almost like a bigger version of the family, layer by layer, layer by layer, uh, through analogy, right? But then, the family state were, the family and the state were still connected in the 20th century, but in the modern nation or the modern state, they wanted the state to be the only family that truly mattered. Why the parents still had their parental rights? The rationale would be, yes, the parents were in the best position to raise the children, to become citizens. You can see the family was justified by the state, and the state was the only family that truly ideologically mattered, right? And then we can see this was uh, the example I want to demonstrate this sort of how this uh, sort of logic worked in the Republican period before 1949. We will go, oops to this, that, how that worked in the Maoist period. So the Republican period, especially between 1928 and 1949, still it was a party state, right? It was a nationalist party state that often like defined everything according to three principles of the people uh, by uh, Sun Yat-sen who died in 1925, but it was, became such a secret figure, uh, especially under nationalist rule. But that's how Sun Yat-sen you know, used the parent-child relations to justify party dictatorship. He said, the master of the republic, basically means the Chinese nation or the citizenry, is indeed a newborn infant. The revolutionary party is a mother who has born the infant. Since she has given birth to the child, she should raise and educate the child. Only then could she be regarded as having fulfilled her revolutionary duties. That is why a period of political tutelage is prescribed in our principles of revolution for the purpose of guiding the young master into adulthood so that political power could be returned to the master. You can see a lot of like continuity between the late imperial time and early 20s or here, here the late 1910s and the logic of the party state in the uh, 1920s, 30s, 40s, right? Still, Parental infallibility. The state knew better, and they could uh, they, they knew better than citizens themselves uh, about what the citizens need, what the citizens want, right? But also, you can see some modern notion that is temporary, right? It's just a stage. Eventually, the citizens are raised to be adults that are on the equal footage of their parents, right? This is a very modern notion that was very different from the imperial times. But what returns? In the post-1949 period, we will see on the one side, the Mao Zedong really, you know, he would say like, we struck down everything, four O's, all those failure party was nonsense, etc. But we can see even more continuity. The first was, you know, the Mao Zedong always like as a father figure, he knew best, right? Uh, but also that was a lifelong. Mao Zedong never promised constitutional rule as the Republic promised. The Republic would say, you are not ready, right? You are, you are citizens, you are infants, but you will be ready within a few decades. Mao Zedong said, it's lifelong, right? Here, as in this lesson one, 爹亲娘亲不如毛主席亲, like father's dear, mother's dear, but Chairman Mao is dear rear. There's a song even like, 爹亲娘亲不如毛主席亲. It's out there, right? Um, they basically persuade the citizens that, you know, 
of course, you can see these like new things, but connect directly to the state. Right? Your parents are very secondary. However, Chairman Mao remains a big figure forever. He always knows best, right? And you can see this very weird combination, hybridity, that you know, on the one hand, they were no longer, people were no longer expected to be loyal to their own parents. But on the other hand, Mao Zedong was not some, somebody they could question. They could appeal to Mao Zedong's authority over everything. For example, this guy, his name was uh, John the Right Soldier, right? And he accused his own mom. So his mom was a revolutionary cadre, but she got disillusioned by the Cultural Revolution, so she put down the Mao Zedong's portrait. He reported on her, and she got shot. And now, of course, she was, he would say, like, I'm not even as good as an animal. Da, 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 da. But you can see the logic that the, everyone's loyalty was with the party and with Chairman Mao, right, who knows better. Because it went so extreme during such a chaotic period of the Cultural Revolution, 1960s and 70s, etc., it was so extreme. It was as unnatural as the Qing legal regime that upheld absolute parental authority, right? So you can see, like after 1970, after Mao's death in the 1980s, China witnessed a revival of filial piety. Like people started to see, like, yes, my family, my spouse, or my parents, or my children are the most important thing. Right? It isn't about the utopia future. Who cares about that? It's all about family. Right? And if people stop talking about politics, people focus on their own families. And this sort of thing starts to be used again by the state in recent years to call for obedience. For example, this was in one of the posters here, the China Dream, Xi Jinping's China Dream, right? the socialist core values, and I also know would bad we got really baffled by what socialist core values of filial parity is so feudal, right? But that's Xi Jinping's socialism. And you have this like Meng Wah or dream girl who is very, you can see the posture, but also about filial parity. You can see like grandson served the father, father served his own father. It's very patrilineal also, right? Here, in combination of the more the nationalism, right? The, 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 the country or the nation was portrayed as a mom. And then it's, they try to use this filial sentiment. People feel toward their mother to justify in nationalism to say, like, you know, it's so much debt you own to your mother country, etc. And it's very interesting that Zhu Guo, um, our ancestral country, is described as a mother, it's a family figure, while Zhu itself is a ritualized. Penis is a masculine word. But anyway, why it is the case is always what I try to argue is really filial piety is not just about love between parents and children. Filial piety is a very politicized, instrumentalized understanding. And um, legal institutions and ritual institutions that basically used intergenerational relations for political goals. And I don't need to see that because the sages in Chinese history, they already figured it out. The most recent here is Han Feizi, right? And China was often called, in pure China was called Confucian legally state. And many people would say that that was, the, the Confucian empire was just surface, it was a face. And the dynamic of operation of the empire was a legalist empire. And Han Feizi was one of the founding masters of legalism. He said, the official served the ruler, the son served his father, the wife serves her husband. If these three are down, then all under heaven is ordered. If these three are not down, then all under heaven is in chaos. And then the second oldest was Confucius himself. He said, those who behaved filially, obediently towards their parents and submissively toward their elder siblings seldom show a disposition to resist the authority of their superiors. As uh, and as for such men starting a rebellion, no instance of it has ever occurred. But Laozi, who was the master to some extent, it was recorded that the Confucius actually asked for wisdom from Laozi. He said, it was filial piety, it was parental benevolence. He said, when the great way is abandoned, there are benevolence and the righteousness. When the wisdom and the intelligence come forth, there's great hypocrisy. When the six familial relationships are out of balance, there are kind parents and filial children. When the state is in turmoil and chaos, there are loyal ministers. So, you know, I, I, almost when I write this, I feel like 
why I need to repeat this, because Lau's already figured it out. <laughs> but anyway, um, thank you for your patience. Um, yes, that's it. Thank you, and your critiques and questions are greatly appreciated. Yeah. And I think we need to circulate this, right? Oh, yeah, there is another one, seems to Thank you so much for <clears throat> sharing your work. Um, you have such fantastic cases, and I can only imagine the work that went into choosing the right cases to put the book, the book's arguments together, right? Because it's a big span of time. It's a, it's a number of important transitions. Um, and as you said, it, it's incredibly ambitious. Um, so... The question I ask, I, so I feel terrible asking you this question, Mara, because you've already done so much. But one of the things I'm wondering about, um, and it's, you, you can maybe understand why, because I work on colonialism, um, how do anxieties about racial and ethnic difference in these familial politics play out, right? And, and maybe I'm thinking about the many minority groups in modern China that are never completely integrated into the nation, either in the empire or uh, in the republic period, right? And um, so my, my impression is not all families are the same, right? And I guess I would love to hear a little bit more about that, especially because you gave us that map of where they were, right? Um, and and I think they weren't, yeah, there. Um, and, and maybe that tells a story that answers this question, but I think it was quite striking to me that um, that the, the disputes that you detailed are really disputes about violence or disruption between family members rather than a disruption to the local community, right? Um, and of course, you know, in the U.S., there's all kinds of disruptions, right? Like... Um, you know, loving versus Virginia and interracial, you know, the ways that miscegenation yeah, is yeah, regulated. Yeah. And, and I guess I, I would love to hear a little bit more about that. Yes, thank you so much about the question. That really gives me opportunity to articulate uh, more about the ethnic aspects of this project. So I have to admit that this project is very much centered on the Han or the Manchu part of the empire because both parts use the same code that was a greeting code. So we often see like, oh, the Qing Empire was very much like a empire of five major races and they, they were managed differently. Uh, but I think there were more complexities here. The first, in terms of uh, criminal and uh, civil cases, the Manchu and the Han, they use the same code that was the greeting code. Only different procedures, especially the punish uh, very particular punishments for those Manchus who committed crimes, but the crimes were not as serious as a, that it didn't lead to death penalty. So they were exiled to different places, probably a little bit nicer. Uh, um, but you know, one of the, 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 the local archives I used was from the Shuangcheng, uh, the, 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 basically the Manchu Rim place. And also there were banner population discussed in the cases that were in the, like the cases were found in the central archives because it submitted, they were submitted for review. It seems that in terms of parent-child relations, the expectation for the Manchu and Han were the same. For the Mongols and the Xinjiang, so the Qing had a different treatment of uh, criminal cases, major criminal cases, and civil cases plus minor criminal cases. So for uh, civil cases, minor, uh, civil cases plus minor crime criminal cases, the local laws were used. In, Mongol period, uh, in, in the Mongol uh, place, it was called Mongolian Statute Code, and in Xinjiang, it was Sharia law. So the state actually didn't think it had like ideological significance. But in, in terms of major criminal cases, such as parasite cases, they were all handled with the greeting code because the state really cared about this symbolic importance of the parent-child like hierarchy, and for civil cases you do whatever you want, but for the major cases they wanted to, you know, basically to have some sort of unity. The Tibet, 
uh, the Qing basically had very little control over anything except for the you know, appointment of Dalai Lama, etc. So the Tibet was a totally separate uh, regime. But in terms of the 20th century, um, my focus was mostly on this China proper, partly because the Republic had very little control over Mongolia or Tibet or Xinjiang, etc. So it's very difficult to see how things happened on the ground. But the code was supposed to be universal. Also, it, the code was very much westernized. It was almost like a copy of the German code. Uh, and it was almost like a copy of the Japanese code, which was a copy of the German code. So you can see like the expectation was everywhere. It was uh, universal, but the implementation was very limited in those ethnic regions. But then the logic, I think the logic uh, was very important in terms of like connect everyone directly to the state was very important. After 1949, when Mao Zedong and the Chinese Communist Party did have the capacity to reinforce everything, they basically, uh, they on the one side, the Chinese Communist Party honored local customs, but in a very superficial way. It wasn't about law, um, law or in terms of like family relations, it was more about the language and also the, the costumes, etc., and they use the class nation to justify that. So they would say like, "Oh yes, everyone was part of the nation as long as they were working class." So it, it sort of like conceptualized the nation differently, uh, which had very little to do with the so-called traditional Chinese culture. So they would say like, "Yes, the, the working class in Xinjiang or in Tibet, they were all good, or the landlords, they were all bad." Everywhere, it doesn't matter. Like the landlords were not part of the nation, and the, the working people were part of the nation. And if you are part of the nation, you are supposed to be good. You are supposed to conform to the new marriage law, everything. Uh, and of course, the whole system fell apart after Mao Zedong's death because they no longer uh, stay to the so class nation thing. But in terms of the connection they wanted people to have with the state, it was very uniform. Basically, the whole work unit system, collective farming, everything, it, the logic was still like separate every, everyone from their community, from their family, so they could be subjugated directly to the state. Right? I think that's the, you know, the story, at least from my perspective, I don't think I can get really to the details of these ethnic uh, regions, but we can see some of the logic here. And in terms of colonial influence, um, even though the Nationalist Party would try to argue that, oh, we are so different like, because the, your American countries, they are about like, individualism, they are very corrupt, we have like, but the, the whole logic is very universal and it was some sort of a colonial project because what the, the modern state tried to project the image was we are just another modern country with the same sort of view, right? Also, it was a re reaction to colonial invasion, basically, because what they wanted um, from the late Qing onward, they were not saying like, this is right. Often they say like, we need to reform either in the conjugal relations or generational relations, because if we don't, China as a regime or the government would not survive. So it's just like, they just want, they also say like, yes, in Western countries or in Japan, the family had, they made decisions on behalf of the children until the children reach adulthood. But once that happened, everyone served the state. That's why they're strong. So they try to figure things out. But that was a reaction to the colonial, basically the, the, the global colonial order. And on the one hand, we can see that, you know, the, the, this sort of self-orientalization, we say our like, stuff is very bad, it's China is bad because of this. But also it really provided the people on the ground, especially the younger generation, a means to try to at least free themselves to this, this hierarchy. So it's almost like everything had two sides. On the one side, the state really didn't care about like, the individual rights. They, were, didn't, they didn't even try to hide, right? But then the, the children could use that, adult children could use that to sue their parents, to say like, that's my property, I don't want to marry that guy, right? Or the kids could get some protection from the police because you know, they, they, they now, became the assets of the state. So it's very complicated, uh, I would say, yeah. Thank you.
Uh, thank you for the really great talk. <clears throat> I had a question about, uh, so we, our class, we're talking about nationalism, right? And uh, I was uh, kind of curious on whether in your research you uh, saw trends of within the kind of ethnic groups in uh, the 56 different ethnic groups in China, whether, <clears throat> because like my assumption would be that there could be uh, different uh <laughs> different, uh, I don't want to say percentages, but uh, approaches towards Confucianism, mm. uh, even amongst the ethnic groups, like, because there, there would be certain ethnic groups that like 100% would think of Confucianism while uh, maybe others that are far away from China or far away from Han to have less of an idea of Confucianism maybe. And so would you say that uh, amongst those ethnic groups, uh, there was also uh, varying levels, varying degrees of kind of following that principle of filiality. Yes, thank you very much. So in terms of the ethnic um, map, I, you know, I had um, to add up to what I just said about the major ethnic blocks. And there were two so-called two tiers, according to existing scholarship, there, are two, there were two tiers of ethnic minorities during the Qing. The first tiers were the like Mongols, the Tibetans. They were supposed to keep their culture. At least the Qing court honored their culture. But there were other ethnic groups in the Southwest, especially in Yunnan, Guizhou, those smaller ethnic groups. There was never a thing about, you know, you, you keep your own culture. It was always about the signification. And so it was called civilization. <laughs> they would not say it was signification. But basically, it's like Confucianism, the introduction of schools, and you get like, uh, you, you, you participate in the civil service examination, something like that. So in these regions, the upper class were very much Confucianized to some extent, right? So, um, but then in the 20th century, because the, the state was down with Confucianism, at least for the most part, so the issue was the upper class. Right, they were Confucianized. The lower class, they practice whatever, right? They, they're their own practice. And in the 50s, a lot of things would happen in the 50s, 60s, why the Chinese Communist Party got into so much trouble. Because in many ethnic regions, the upper class were Confucianized. When they tried to promote those progressive understanding of family, they resisted, they, they, they met this resistance, right? And also because this upper class were no longer part of the people, so they, um, the, 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 the state really just um, got rid of them and mobilized the people to got rid of them, right? Either against Confucianism or their own ethnic culture. Because usually it was the upper class that you know, kept the, 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 the elite part of the ethnic culture more systematic, et cetera, right? And it, but it was done in the name of the class. And it was done in the name of modernity. Right? It wasn't done in the name of Confucianism because the state itself didn't believe in Confucianism anymore. So it doesn't matter whether it, it was done in these regions that the upper class were Confucianized, or in Tibet, or in Xinjiang, the upper class was not Confucianized. Because whatever often that was there, it was going to be overthrown. Right? And everyone was connected to the state in the sense that it doesn't matter what you think about your parents. You can be like Uyghur or whatever, but Chairman Mao is always the, the guy like, you need to refer to. So it, basically, all old things were supposed to be wiped out. Right? So you can see that I'm not quite sure about whether there were different like, reactions in different ethnic regions. But then what they tried to do was just the younger people, sometimes they just use state rhetoric against whatever authorities that, out, that were out there. And what happened after Mao's death was you know, during the Moist period, basically everyone was called up to overthrow the authorities, and it could be like failure party, whatever, right? After that, class nation was no longer there. So the worst they tried to figure out was how to deal with all those uh, catastrophe that happened. So we can see the revival of Confucianism in China proper among the Han population, but the revival, of, for example, of Islam in Xinjiang, of Tibetan Buddhism in Tibet. So, Everything that was originally there got uh, recognized to some extent in the 1980s and 90s because the state tried to basically fix some of the issues caused by this aggressiveness of itself during the Cultural Revolution. So you can see, like, oh, filial piety got revision in China proper and then Islam, et cetera, in other regions, right? And what was happening in recent years is the state 
try to unify the country again, also culturally. So what they are trying to do basically to impose Han culture everywhere, right? And then, then what, they're, what, what they have, the Marxism is toothless now. So what they try to do is to use Confucianism everywhere, right? and also nationalism to unify. So eventually the ideal, I guess, what Xi Jinping expects to say is all those ethnic regions would be assimilated into the Han. And the Han is defined by two things. The first was a traditional culture, right? good things that have been passed by for generations. The second was the Chinese Communist Party and what the Chinese Communist Party imagines the nation should be about. Right, that's a little bit vague, but yeah, I hope it addresses your question. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Mara, for presenting your book. I learned so much from it. And my question is um, somewhat related to Professor Gosh's question. And because um, I was also thinking about um, nationality law and how is the criteria of who can belong to China or has a Chinese national change over time. And um, I was thinking how um, China like uh, renounced uh, dual citizenship for um, Hua, Hua Chao or other yes. Chinese. Chinese diaspora, but then also um, how foreigners would have to file applications to um, and then get approved, right, to become part, um, as, to be recognized for um, uh, permanent residence or um, as Chinese um, nationals. So I was wondering how that might um, weave into your arguments about uh, this change um, or this co-evolution um, of family and and states and and. Or are you planning to do more about that in your second book? Yes. Okay, great. So I'm still working on the theoretical framework of my second book. I hope my answer would address that like, at least uh, prove to be useful to some extent to uh, what you are thinking about nationality law, etc. So during the Qin, the whole sovereignty was defined uh, in a very different way than the you know the, the modern Westphalian system in the sense that different. Uh, different ethnic blocks were connected to the emperor as a father mother, right? Uh, connected to the person of the emperor. What the Qin tried to do in its later years in the second half of the 19th century was to transform the Qin empire as the ruler and then all those subjects through layered like kind of connection connect to him to a country or the imperial nation. It was an empire, but it was a trans dynasty entity, and they even consider change the name from the Qing Empire into the Chinese Empire. So they wanted it to be trans dynasty in the sense. And once that happened, they, they, they started to reconceptualize themselves, not in terms of the connection between each subject, not just through layered connection to the emperor, but to, it was a connection to the nation. And it, nation, obviously, it was very multi-ethnic. So what they were trying to do, they tried to redefine nation in the sense that it was a territorial nation. Now everyone within the Qing borders were Qing subjects or Chinese. There was a nationality law of the late Qing. They would say, yes, anybody whose father was a Chinese subject, which means it could be like a person from Mongol, right? It didn't matter. As long as it was a Qing subject, they, they refer it to as Chinese subjects. Basically, they redefined the China according to the Qin, right? And then they would have citizenship. It was defined by the blood, you can see, like, right? And then it means a lot of overseas Chinese were citizens. It was carried on by the Republican government that the, the, according to the Republican nationality law, everyone who had a sort of like Chinese blood was part of the Chinese nation. That's why there were a lot of conflicts between the nationalist government and the colonial government of British Malaya, uh, colonial government of British Malaya. Because for the nationalist government, you know, we have these Chinese citizens we need to manage. And British Malaya was like, you are building a nation within the nation. We have like such a large percentage of Chinese. What are you going to do? And it has something to do with the different conceptualization of colonization that was shared by the Chinese and the Japanese in the 1920s and 30s, that they wanted to send out people to occupy the land. So as long as it's our people, it doesn't matter. Like You can have your government, but we colonize that. right? What happened after 1949 was the PRC, the People's Republic of China, started to define, um, define the nation 
civically. It doesn't mean you have political participation, but basically means like they, they, they define everyone that was part of the working class, but also within China as part of the nation. So those people who are Chinese citizens, but who are landlords, et cetera, they were animals, so they, they were Chinese citizens, but you know, they didn't have any rights. But also the overseas Chinese, because it wasn't about blood anymore, right? If you are not within China and you were under capitalist rule, whatever, they were just not Chinese. So basically the PRC almost like abandoned for many local Chinese overseas, out there in Southeast Asia, they really felt they were abandoned because the government no longer wanted them, they no longer had the citizenship. So it was all cut off, right? I'm not quite sure whether it had not anything to do with the family, especially not the intergenerational relations, but it did have something to do with how, you know, who got to define the nation. Why the, the nation was defined according to some sort of criteria, such as, oh, it was defined according to citizenship, or according to ethnicity, right, blood, or the state could define it, right, now that, you know, if we change the uh, criteria, like, we can make new laws, and then you are no longer part of the game, right, it has something to do with who got to define the nation, I guess, yes, but I, I still try to put everything together, thank you.